So um, welcome to the third event of Reclaiming Land, a symposium that is looking at the decommodification of property for racial and social equity. Um, I'm Antje Steinmiller. I'm an associate professor at California College of the Arts, um, where I also chair the Bachelor of Architecture program and uh, with Miraj Bhatia, who's here with me, um, co-direct the Urban Works Agency. Miraj? Hi, I'm Niraj Bhatia. I'm an associate professor at the California College of the Arts, and I also run a practice called the Open Workshop. So I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Um, California College of the Arts campuses are located in Huichin and Yilamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively, on the unceded territories of Chichenyu and Ramiatush Ohlone peoples who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, including the forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples past, present and future here and around the world and we wish to pay respect to local elders. Our event today is the last session of a three-part event that began last week with a session titled Property in Crisis, followed by a workshop named Explicit Properties. The first event asked how property can be reimagined to structure inclusive benefits and expanded ac accountability in the face of volatile climates, exploitative markets, defunded public health, and ever-widening social and racial inequity. The Exquisite Properties Workshop hosted a range of experts in a collaborative setting to invent alternate property paradigms. Tonight's event is titled Commoning Practice as Acts of Resistance and will explore commoning practices as an alternate form of land organization that sits outside the speculative market. We will look at alternative financial and planning models that span from public to private space, the city to the house, the top down to the bottom up. Before we uh, get into what got us to this topic and this work, I would like to make sure to thank our Dean Keith Cromwitty for, for providing the space and platform for this discussion, as well as Sarah Mefta for the hard work behind the scenes to make it all happen. So um, starting our slides here. Um, this inquiry for us at the Urban Works Agency emerges from our geography in San Francisco and Northern California more generally. On the one hand, the commodification of housing driven by market speculation has left many seeking alternatives that respond to a more diverse range of family types, offers affordability and provides more agency in how we might define the spaces that then define our lives, defines our lives. On the other hand, this geography is the center of countercultural movements from the 1960s rooted in the rejection of commercialism and ideology of shared property and labor. Sorry. So this, um, this study has resulted in a series of conferences and symposia, and we're really trying to get a diverse group of people together, engaging scholars, curators, residents, developers, practitioners, government agencies, as well as nonprofits. And we find that uh, many of these actors need to be at the table to look at these issues. This has also been uh, the topic of our design studios wherein students examine the relationship between domestic space and commenting practices. Um, we'll now show a short video of some of the ongoing research being conducted at the Urban Works Agency, as well as some design projects by my office, the Open Workshop, to be exhibited at the upcoming Venice Biennale. So there has been an amazing history of architecture and urbanism that emerged and evolved through living together. While we have forgotten this in the last century and veered towards private property and ownership, this rich history holds many lessons for us. This is particularly important as recent data suggests that the nuclear family is no longer the norm, people are increasingly nomadic, and housing prices have inflated in many cities. People are looking to find alternative forms of social units, home, and community. We chose to research and analyze a series of communal living case studies from intentional communities to those of convenience. How can we learn from these social and spatial types? What we looked at was the relationship between the architecture or what we call hardware, 
how individuals lay claim to space or what we term software and the governance and distribution of labor or what we call orgware. Our assumption was that these needed to be considered to support each other for space and politics to find resonance. Living together is not easy. It requires forms of sacrifice and continuous social labor, but its benefits outweigh these issues. In this, agency in shaping collective life is a critical component of forming meaningful long-term communities. Our research sheds lights on elaborately constructed forms of governance of the domestic commons and the social life in the community. In the resulting documentation and design work, we ponder how the articulation of spatial adjacencies fosters the formation of various social units and instigates communal interaction, positing that ultimately the architecture itself acts as the convener of a social life that corresponds with today's lifestyles and need for alternative family units. So the spatial contracts within a collective housing community is not only what distinguishes these social arrangements through being defined and continuously redefined by the users, it offers agencies over one's way of life. This requires a redefinition of the public and private spaces and associated norms we might put on these spaces. The orgware of the project defines the political system, the mechanisms for government, accountability, and stewardship. Further, it makes clear labor, domestic, social, emotional, material, and immaterial that is required to live together. We are interested in how the orgware and architecture come together to form a larger spatial contract. Within five design projects, we examine different ways that sharing can happen between resources, space, and time, as well as different mechanisms to configure and reconfigure the architecture. What we're interested in is how architecture provides a framework that offers agency to the users while maintaining a collective cohesiveness to structure a conversation greater than the sum of its parts. Further, these typologies examine how a system can be created to offer vast amounts of difference to acknowledge the complex subtleties of different ways of life. We see the house as a central place of politics, enacted through everyday acts and interactions, as well as through the negotiations that occur in space. Studying ways of commoning domestic space serves as an experiment on how people might have more agency over the house, but also offers insights on how we might scale up this agency beyond the boundaries of individual buildings to the city and to the planetary commons. So today's last session will speculate on how land can more equitably be distributed and tap into experimental approaches from around the world that reimagine platting, organization, and governance of land. Speakers are especially invited to consider commoning as an alternative to commodification. Central to this question are the ways in which spatial resources are held, governed, and stewarded by the commoners. And we're really excited today to have this incredible series of guests. Um, so I'm going to introduce our guests in the order that they will be uh, presenting today. Um, first off, Stavros Stavridis, who is an architect, activist, and associate professor at the School of Architecture and the National uh, Technical University of Athens, where he teaches courses on social housing design, as well as postgraduate courses on social meaning and signification of metropolitan experiences. He is author of Common Space, a key reference for this conference. Uh, Robin C. Spencer, who is a historian who researches, whose research centers on social protest after World War II, urban and working class radicalism and gender. She's an associate professor of history at Lehman College, the City University of New York. Robin is author of the critical book, The Revolution Has Come, Black Power, Gender, and the Black Panther Party in Oakland. Georgine Theodora is an architect, urban designer, and professor at New Jersey Institute of Technology's College of Architecture and Design, where she directs the Master of Infrastructure Planning program. She's also a founding partner and principal of Interboro, a New York City-based architecture and planning research office, and a co-author of The Arsenal of Exclusion and Inclusion. Stefan Grube is a re registered architect and associate professor in the Carnegie Mellon School of Architecture. His work spans architectural design, urbanism, and research, with a particular focus on spatial practices and the political, as articulated through the negotiation of top-down planning and bottom-up transformation of cities. This research is exemplified in his most recent book, An Atlas of Commoning, Places of Produ Collective Production. We've asked each participant to prepare a 10-minute presentation for tonight's topic prior to a joint conversation, and Stavros will start us off.
You might be uh, muted still, Stavros. There yes. you go. <laughs> well, I, I made it. <laughs> and hello again, without the, the with the mic on. Um, thank you so much for this uh, beautiful opportunity to be with you, to discuss with you this very interesting topic that you propose to join us in a kind of mutual exchange. Um, really sorry that I can't be with you uh, on the time of the actual event. It's a, it's a distance of hours and a distance of miles that prevents me to do so. But I will try to, uh, to somehow uh, intervene in a discussion which I expect to unfold in the following days. So my uh, attempt is to talk about uh, practices uh, that, has to, that have to do with uh, um, the intervention of architectural, uh, let's say, profession, but also the architectural knowledge in forms uh, that actually support uh, commoning as a way of reclaiming actually the space of the city. So, um, let us first agree on certain uh, matters that have to do with the definition of common space. I intend to talk about common space as something which is quite distinct from private space. This is quite obvious, of course, but private space also can be, uh, for example, in the case of a family spaces, can also be treated as common space within a certain small community, which is the family. On the other hand, common space is not public space. Uh, if by public space we actually mean a space managed by a certain authority, and it has always been like that in, throughout the history of cities. Although, of course, lots of cases in which space commoning actually emerges start from an appropriation of existing public spaces. And last but not least, common space is not communal or community space. And by this I try to distinguish it from certain kinds of spaces which are shared, of course, but shared within a certain bounded and very well-defined community. I believe, as I will try to show you, that common space would, should actually overspill the boundaries of the, even of the community which somehow initiates its existence uh, in order to continue to be common. Um, therefore, we can say that common space is a kind of production, it's a kind of uh, thing that happens whenever people actually appropriate space and use it collectively and define the rules of use also collectively. Therefore, it's a place of sharing, but on the other hand, it's also a place in which sharing is actually shaped. Huh? It, because space is not a thing, is not an entity, is not a substance, is not a, a commodity, space is actually a, a relational medium so it can shape the conditions of the practices which unfold within it and this is a, a quite distinct characteristic common space is not one more thing that we can share it's also a shaping factor of commoning and also common space gives us the opportunity to understand the necessity of commoning to actually be expanding huh? If commoning is being limited within the limits of a certain community, no matter how egalitarian this community might be, then um, sooner or later, this kind of space will cease to be common. It will perhaps evolve to a community shared space. And in many cases, we have, we have uh, conditions under which this is a, a form of enclosure, a form of transcending the actual characteristics of commoning. That's why I try to insist that the common space should be understood as a threshold. Now, what is a threshold? Is an intermediary, is an in-between area in which negotiations take place. And I try to define the characteristics of commoning space, the characteristics of this kind of common space by using two words, at least, the idea of comparison and the idea of translation. Let us imagine common space as an area of comparisons not an area in which a homogeneous community reflects and, uh, and understands itself, but really an area in which negotiations take place. So the, the creation of this common world 
is always an issue, is always something to fight for. Therefore, comparison is an essential element that brings together otherness, people who are different, people who are recognizing the possibility of finding common ground, but don't take it for granted. And then translation, what does it mean to translate? Imagine how poetic this process is. It's always in the making. You never reach an end in, in translation because there is always something in excess in this effort to transform the meaning of words of one language to another or the meaning of a text written in a language to a text to be written in another language. So translation is something like an always uh, developing process of creating this common ground. Knowing from the beginning that this is not going to end. This is a, always an effort. So let us imagine common space as a place of comparison and translations. translations. Therefore, a space, a kind of space that happens, a kind of space that is always in the making and it's dependent upon the effort of those who want really to produce it. And what could architecture do? Or could architecture contribute to this process? I think we can at least distinguish three sets, three, three, three uh, let's say, opportunities of uh, architectural interventions that can actually shape and uh, mold space that can be common. First of all, we, we, we should talk about organized spatial relations. Huh? Uh, common space should be, should take the form of organized spatial relations that would be supporting an area in which commoning will take place. So on that level, design and planning can be crucial, can play a very important part. On the other hand, we can see that commoning is to be expressed through space, can be expressed through space. Therefore, on, an, on another level, the architectural practices can contribute to this recognizable expression of values of commoning through space and because of space. And of course, last but not least, commoning would emerge in the processes of production, in the processes of collaboration that may be ignited, let's say, uh, that may be activated in the process of sharing space and in the process of producing space to be shared. This is more or less my, my let's say, argument. And I would just use two cases to illustrate and to promote and to somehow clarify these, these arguments. Just a small note, I think that these are not simply cases to prove something. These are cases from which we can learn and perhaps expand our ideas about uh, common space. And, that, and thus I would just uh, go as fast as I can. Uh, first, the first case is the Uruguayan Federation of Housing Associations through self-help, uh, through mutual help actually, Ayuda Mutua. The interesting thing about this kind of housing uh, uh, pro, uh, practices is that they are based on the, a, a very important tradition of self-management, which is very well rooted in Uruguay. A very important also tradition, which is based on the idea of exchanging uh, services, helping each other, a tradition of, of uh, mutual help, which is very well, especially uh, rooted in the practices of the urban poor of Latin America. And last but not least, Interestingly, the Fukvam uh, endeavor is based on the idea of establishing forms of collective ownership. Believe it or not, even though Uruguay is still a capitalist country, this has been a possibility and a, an opportunity because there was a strong movement pushing in that direction. And as one of the main, uh, let's say, leaders of this, uh, this uh, uh, Federation of Housing Association says, it is one of the oldest American traditions because the idea of collective ownership is strongly connected with the indigenous Americans who knew how to treat land as a collective property, as a property which is maintained and used by uh, communities in communication and in negotiation. So you can see from the images that the, 
collaboration is an essential element of the production. It's not something that is happening just between workers and laborers. Here you see uh, the spread of these cooperatives uh, in the city of Montevideo. And it all starts with claiming the land, uh, struggles that have to do with housing as right. It, it uh, follows practices of assemblies through which the definition of uh, the decision concerning the, the character of the future housing areas is to be defined, is to be uh, promoted. And finally, if they manage to um, get the necessary public loans in order to build this uh, housing estate, then they have to maintain it, they have to celebrate for its construction. It looks like that. In many cases, this is a, a, a especially a housing project which is for uh, single women, women with uh, children, and uh, they, this is promoted by the same Fukpan Federation. And just an emblematic image, this could happen as an emblematic case of sharing space. It's a place in which one recognizes that public areas are actually areas that belong to the people who use them, that rules are defined through use, and actually uh, this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, projects is actually promoting a collective ownership, but not only in terms of the legal status, but also a collective appropriation to use uh, this distinction, which is, as you know, a very famous distinction by Lefebvre. And then it's the second example, it's the kind of commoning neighborhoods which are being developed in Mexico City. They call themselves autonomous neighborhoods. And just see the words of, of one of the activists that belong to these communities. And he insists that they are not only creating housing projects, but also communities. And these communities are trying to solve the problems of living together and being able to create their own history. And this is what they define as autonomy. Interestingly, and this is one of the cases in, in uh, La Porvorilla, which is uh, an area in the outskirts of Mexico City, in which uh, the definition of the area, the, the definition of the planning project, the occupying pro practices of, of land that ended in a kind of uh, negotiation with the local state. And then, of course, the final result, which is a neighborhood comprising of various parts of a uh, neighborhood, um, something like brigadas, that is uh, organized uh, collectives within a larger collective, which actually contribute to the decisions concerning the maintenance and the use, and also they contributed to the initial state, uh, stages in the design of the, of the houses. Just a minor detail that might show something. This kind of, let's say, barrier that distinguishes uh, the small yard from the rest of the common space is a choice developed within uh, the assemblies and because of the insistence of the women participating in the assemblies they, that they needed a perforating, let's say, barrier in order to be, able to be at the same time inside the house and outside the house looking after the children but also participating in the family. Um, and then the other case also, another uh, autonomous neighborhood in, uh, in Mexico City, more connected to the Zapatista, uh, let's say, values of autonomy. And just this image might show you a lot. This is the, the, the plan of the neighborhood. It's just uh, remarkable, it is just remarkable to observe how the names of the street are almost a, a kind of declaration. Huh? Uh, uh, dignity, education, information, justice, democracy, land, housing, freedom. Uh, the, the whole, let's say, settlement, the whole neighborhood somehow declares the values on which it was built. And you can see the, the, the independent small pharmacy, which is used by the surrounding neighborhoods also. It's important to see that those neighborhoods, neighborhoods are not simply secluded areas, areas bounded, and uh, uh, somehow uh, celebrating the otherness uh, compared to the rest of the city, they are more like catalysts because they actually 
uh, have a, a large influence on their surrounding neighborhoods and the people from those neighborhoods often try to use the services of those areas of those autonomous uh, places. My last statement, I think that possible spaces indeed uh, are becoming uh, areas in which we test possible forms of different kinds of social organization. This is what trial by space, uh, this word that was uh, Lefebvre's idea, this is what it means actually, that unless you be able to, to trial, to check your values and your possible forms of social organization by devising forms of space to accommodate it, to promote it and to help it, then you cannot talk about the possibility of changing the society because actually space is the potential which is being performed and through this it's a way of expanding the politics of commoning as a form of reclaiming the city. The right to the city is actually the right to collectively shape the city as a work of art. Thank you so much. Thank you so much Stavros. That was uh, a great way to kick us off and get us all on the same page. Uh, we'll pass it over to Robin. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm happy to be here and take part in this conversation. Um, I think in a lot of ways it's a nice departure from the previous um, comment because I'll be looking at a political organization, the Black Panther Party, one of the leading Black power organizations in the United States, and how they grappled with different commoning practices over the course of their political evolution. So the question of, I think, understanding the reality of the strengths and weaknesses of the Panthers' engagement with collective practices. And I'm also particularly interested in asking how come we don't remember these experimentations. So it's also about not just the Black Panther Party as a case study, but also about the politics of memory and how we can understand and see different elements of history differently. And it's important, I noted, uh, we started out with the conversation about um, Berkeley in California. And the Panthers, of course, were founded in 1966 in Oakland, California. Um, they were founded by Hugh Newton and Bobby Seal, uh, two college students at uh, Merritt College at the time. And it grew from being a local organization to being a nationwide and even international organization. Um, it had chapters all around the country, as well as in several um, countries. And the Panthers were eventually, would come to a close by 1982. Um, they faced a lot of political repression during their lifetime, particularly in the late 60s, early 1970s. And that's where, for me, their, their story begins. Uh, one of the things that they argue was that the kind of revolution that they wanted to see was both internal and external. Um, they wanted to create an organization that would be a microcosm of the world they were trying to create. Um, they were rooted in California, in Northern California and Berkeley meaning that they abutted with and they influenced um, many of the other types of political experiments and radical ideals that were being brought to bear at the time, whether it be um, centers of the white left, um, the Chicanx movement, as well as um, even indigenous struggles as well. And in a lot of ways, they were part of that larger milieu. One of the things that they believed was that they should try to create um, structures within their organization to challenge people's dependence on capitalism. So on the one hand, they were an organization that spoke out against capitalism that struggled and demanded a new economy, a new way of thinking about economic arrangements. But that was just not an external political tact that they took, they also asked, well, how can we create an organization that would prefigure the kind of world that we want to see? How can we create an organization that would be a microcosm? So they had practical application and concrete grounding of their ideas, 
So they began to buy property in the early 1970s and they began to um, embrace a communal lifestyle, which really blurred the borders between workplace and home space and public and private. So they strove to become an organization that could meet its members' needs for food, clothing, and shelter. They created survival programs, as they called them, which were community programs for the local communities, whether it be alternative schools and free health clinics. I'll talk a little bit about those um, later. These were some of the ways that the Panthers embodied this kind of collective idea. So the goal with these things were to uh, be not necessarily to create a structure where people were trying to gain as many access and multiply their free clinics and free schools, but there was always a political project behind that, which was to educate people and have them gain a critical perspective on why wasn't the government providing these things, to have them question commodities, to have them question individualism, to have them question the logics of capitalism that would make it such that a small organization could feed children and the state could not or would not, right? So the Panthers embraced um, communalism in ways that were so rich and vivid in their history, but has remained largely invisible when we look back at this history, right? Um, a lot of it has to do with this idea of, of the counterculture. And even I saw the image of the Summer of Love um, in 1967 and the ways in which race is kind and blackness is kind of excised from an analysis of that larger project. So when we think about communalism in California, there's the assumption is that communards were all hippies. In actuality, although hippie communes have come to define our popular and conceptual understanding, they were the minority of intentional communities. Um, when we think about the counterculture in a broader way and we decenter hippies and we think about an engagement with radical politics and a rebellion against the American mainstream and cultural norms, um, we can really begin to explore the vision of self-transformation the idea of the personal being political, which is something associated with the women's movement, as well as um, this ideal of redefining oneself, which was part of black radicalism. And think about how did commoning practice, how did commoning practices sort of emerge at the intersection of all of those things, right? So for example, the Panthers had a huge impact on the diggers in San Francisco and their idea of free everything. And um, this idea of for the Panthers, however, was based on providing this alternative to capitalism by um, challenging commodification um, as well. So the Panthers are considered part of the 1% of non-whites living in communes, um, according to uh, historian Timothy Miller. Um, actually looking at them as like a large experiment in communal living. We could also add to them the MOVE organization in Philadelphia. Um, as well. But for the Panthers, they adapted this communal ideology to suit their needs. So for them, it translated into collective living, collective parenting, and the creation of these alternative institutions, right? So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on each of those um, to get a sense of that. Especially, I want to highlight that uh, these commoning practices were, were um, really very hierarchical in the organization. So they were really things to be found at the rank and file level of the organization as well. Their day-to-day -day lives were oftentimes very communal, uh, very collective um, as well. So that's what I wanted to, um, to kind of, where I wanted to kind of orient the conversation. Well, the initial collective the Panthers came up with were born out of expediency and they consisted of rank and file members living together. Um, these mixed spaces that were living spaces, working spaces and accommodations for guests um, really began the, were the soil on which the larger collective structure um, grew out of. This collective living was really seen as providing uh, this alternative and political education was seen as part of this. Right, so this ideal that one had to educate oneself, not just to educate external members to sort of educate the community in a political way, but also to be engaged in a project of self-education um, as well. 
one of the things they did in terms of creating um, counter institutions was to really uh, challenge some of the commodification of particularly social services. So I'm gonna uh, take a moment here and just share the screen so you can see um, this slide there. So they talked about different ways to help the communities survive in key, in key ways. So they created what were called community survival programs, which were an offshoot and a continuation of their community programs they'd started in the 1960s. And the idea was these programs would be temporary models aimed at alleviating economic distress while teaching self-help and community control. And the idea was that meeting the needs of poor communities would highlight the inability of the state to address poverty um, as well. So graphic artist Emery Douglas represented the the ideal of this in this image of the survival nurse, which I've shared with you. Um, so you can think about that, that nurse standing there with, uh, you know, representing people's free busing, clothing, free shoes, liberation schools, free groceries, um, working for the free health clinic as well as this idea of I am a revolutionary. And this is very central because oftentimes when we do think about the history of the Panthers and its legacy, it's oftentimes a legacy of armed self-defense. It's very male. Um, this is a different sensibility around what the Panthers political project was about, what was really radical about what the Panthers wanted to do. In terms of health and education. Robin, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I, I don't know if the screen share came through, so um, we're not seeing the image. Um, maybe you can try again, because I know this is part of your argument. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It would be very essential to see the image. Um, let's see. Is that coming through now? Uh, I don't no? see it on my side, unfortunately. Yeah. All right. I'm just going to take a few moments for tech. Is it visible it now? Is. And your whole desktop is visible. So maybe if you click on the image um, yes. mm -hmm. and hit, uh, I believe it's Apple L, it'll be perfect. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Great. So there you get uh, the broader idea. So as I've mentioned, you see all of the different ways that that image represents the various survival programs that they were, they had initiated. And as well, as I mentioned, it, it gives a different sensibility, very different than the typical images of the Black Panther men in uniform carrying weapons, right? It, it gives a different sense of what their legacy um, was. The Panthers eventually would adopt collective parenting as a way of challenging and as a way of one, allowing for Panther parents to still be full-time activists, to challenge the um, privatization of childcare and, and its commodification. So they provided kind of a collective structure for, for their, the young children that were part of their larger organizational structure. So one Panther member said, for example, they, she was taking care of her from dusk till dawn. Um, as a as a as a mother, from the education of the child to um, the feeding, all of the care items that one would think of, and basically you were, as she says, quote, you were giving your kids on the weekend, um, Monday through Friday, the organization would take care um, of the children, and in a real way, it kind of um, was this alternative way of thinking about that. So in addition to the collective living, there was collective parenting as well. Um, their school was a big part of their collective structure where Panther children attended the school, but the schools were also open to other members of the Oakland community. And the school was very non-hierarchical so that the children had a big role in running the school. The school really brought in the parents as well as the children. It was like a whole sort of holistic whole family kind of experience. And the Panthers also in very real ways tried to um, politically control the time that its members had, right? This was a situation where it was a political organization. So as the Panthers were giving you childcare, 
the assumption was your work would then become uh, the work of the organization. So whether it be attending, staffing, um, co-running these programs, those kinds of things. The idea of free time was really revolutionized in terms of how they, how they saw their whole lifestyle, right? So in a real sense, that became one of the things that they did. In addition, they had a, a religious organization, an original, original uh, religious structure, I should say, called the Son of Man Temple, where their members attended. It was also open um, for the public as well as to provide kind of a spiritual coherence to um, some of the political goals that they had and also provide a kind of non-denominational platform for their political program to reach out to people who would be attracted to that type of of structure. So the Panthers successfully uh, ran these programs in the early 1970s through the mid 1970s. Um, over time, of course, the political education structures became weaker um, in the face of continuing repression, in the face of, um, I think, the ways that people felt unfulfilled politically and personally in different parts of this structure. So, for example, lots of letters with parents talking about the need for more time with their children individually, that kind of um, that kind of thing. So in a lot of ways, the Panther story kind of gives us a sense of how radical political actors can kind of take this idea of the collective and commoning practices and reframe it for their own uh, political goals. I think it's important to understand the role that this plays in the Black radical tradition and it also um, American radicalism as a whole, and also to understand why such activities have been so hidden, right? And what does it mean that the Panthers were radically um, making these transformations? Is, th is this more radical than, for example, their self-defense stance, right? Is it more radical to think about collectively taking care of children for free um, as a way of challenging and providing a lived experience of what it might look like to live in an alternative kind of structure. And uh, live according to rules that were of hierarchy within the organization and anti-democratic practices, I think really did in this collective idea uh, within the organization. So, in some ways, I think it's also, um, it's not a success story in that way, but I think the imagination, the radical imagination is something that uh, should and could be studied and it should be studied in alongside what was happening in the counterculture, what was happening in the women's movement around the question of the personal and the political, because they, they dealt with questions like who was going to do what type of work within the household. They dealt with questions like, how are we going to get clothing for these new members of the organization? Are we going to barter? Are we going to collectively give in our extra stuff and have that reallocated and be okay with that as versus um, the possessiveness? And I do think that in today's um, activism that those sorts of ideals would be really, really generative to sit with because oftentimes our affiliation and association with our individual possessions never get challenged in a radical sense or our, um, our idea of my child being my, under my authority and only my authority never being challenged. So I do think that there's elements of their legacy that speaks to, um, you know, just uh, not just I think within the United States, but as this panel reflects kind of a global engagement with these ideas in this time. So thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. A uh, really amazing history and um, really uh, inspiring series of programs that they've set up. Um, I'm going to switch over now to uh, Georgine, um, taking us back well, to a different part of the New York area. <laughs> Hello. 
can you hear me? Yes. Okay, that's great. Um, thank you, uh, Antia and Niraj, for this invitation. And it's also really uh, an honor to present among this panel. And I'm just excited to be here with this group. Um, is there some kind of message popping up? Everything good? Oh, it's the recording. Okay. Everything good for us. Everything is good. Okay, great. Um, so as was mentioned at the beginning, I'm a professor at New Jersey Institute of Technology, uh, where uh, I direct the Master of Infrastructure Planning Program. And I am also a principal and co-founder of Interboro Partners, uh, which is led by me, uh, Tobias Ambors and Daniel Dioka. And we're architects, planners, and urban designers based in Brooklyn and Detroit. And our projects are, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pause here because I'm still kind of um, sitting with Robin's presentation and thinking um, about how to transition to mine. And uh, we're very much interested in urban history and um, I'm just really grateful to follow Robbins and to have um, heard her presentation. And, um, and while a lot of our work deals with urban history, uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is really more about our practice. And so I think that there's a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a transition here, but I'm um, looking forward to having um, a, the conversation af afterwards. But what I'm gonna talk about today um, is uh, engages with uh, urban history, but I'm going to actually present um, a project. And um, most of, I would say all of our projects, um, they deal uh, with the public realm and the commons. And so I hope to touch upon some of the issues that were discussed by the two previous speakers, but then also um, maybe uh, connect to some of the broader topics of this, of this, of the series um, about property and also um, this particular event, which is about uh, the commenting. So, um, in our our projects, which I said are dealing with the public realm, uh, we we engage with the public realm in different ways, and and in some cases, uh, we're designing public spaces. Uh, sometimes temporary, um, sometimes self-initiated, often with very limited resources, often as part of um, community development uh, processes. And we also develop uh, what we call conversational pieces or conversation pieces. These are designed objects that help visualize and democratize the planning process. Um, and these are tools that are not so much about planning for public space, but really making the planning process itself more public by bringing new actors into the, into the process. We also uh, develop plans for neighborhoods and cities and regions. Um, and we deploy a lot of that small scale conversational work with the goal uh, to develop plans that are more meaningful for the communities that they, that, uh, that they serve. And four, we do independent research that informs our practice. And this is stuff uh, uh, that is really the basis or the foundation of our of our built work, but is also uh, takes shape um, and form in exhibitions and, and publications. Uh, for my presentation, I'd like to focus on an ongoing project in Detroit that we've been working on over the years. Um, and uh, we've not only been working on it over time, but also in different uh, contexts and it, it it's a project that really engages with these four with these four categories that I just uh, that I just introduced, and this is a project that started back in two thousand and five, and when we were really working uh, independently uh, as part of a uh, kind of well, really using tools of design as a form of research. Uh, it's a it's a project called Improve Your Lot, and it was a it was a project about finding a hidden story about everyday practices, and and making that and and making that visible. And um, that and 
the the project uh, was about making visible and advocating for what we called blotting. And um, this is, uh, 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 it was a, it, what we called, a, it, it, well, it is a transformative practice um, of Detroit residents who basically are expanding their properties by taking, borrowing, um, or buying adjacent land and creating new patterns of ownership and, and creating new models of, of land tenure. And um, over, over the uh, past 10 years, these practices have become more visible. The city's planning policy actually shifted. Um, and instead of fighting these informal um, appropriations, they actually have embraced it. Now, more recently, uh, we completed a neighborhood plan for the city's planning development department, where we continue to engage and build upon and strengthen these um, practices of appropriation. Uh, this is the uh, plan for the camp of Bangletown Davison area. And um, this is a neighborhood or a collection of neighborhoods that um, is in uh, northern Detroit. It's really marked uh, by stark discrepancies. Um, some uh, parts of uh, the planning area are, 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 are have a lot, a lot of vacant land kind of emptied out. And those are the areas that in the upper right and the lower left corner. Um, and uh, and then there's other parts where there's really quite a bit of investment and redevelopment, um, much of it uh, driven by the Bangladeshi immigrant community, and that's more in the in the center of this image. And so initially, um, uh, some uh, Bengali immigrants came here uh, to this the, to this neighborhood from Queens in New York. Uh, this happened a couple of decades ago. But nowadays, this is, uh, this is kind of the first landing place um, Bangladeshi immigrants come uh, to the United States uh, because this is um, uh, an area that has all the commercial and religious and support infrastructure um, that, uh, that members of that community are, are, are looking for. So um, there, like I said, there's a lot of redevelopment in some parts, but then other parts um, of the planning area really marked by disinvestment and a lot of vacancy. And, and so as you can see in this um, image here um, in the kind of darker uh, green, there is a, uh, there's a lot of uh, vacant city owned land and the city uh, was looking to us to ask what should happen to it. And, um, and what we proposed uh, was a, a pack a, what you could call as a patchwork of approaches. Um, and if we just kind of um, zoom in uh, on this is the same area. So this is all of the land that is owned uh, by, currently owned by the Detroit Land Bank. Um, these are areas that we proposed that should be um, reserved for uh, like green infrastructure um, projects. And these, we said should be reserved um, for lots. And then here, uh, reserves for stewarding, and which I'm gonna talk about a little bit more. This is land where people don't actually own the title, but they're, they're taking care of it. And then um, uh, for bundling some of the parcels and actually um, selling or in fact giving that to groups, um, community organizations, groups that need uh, larger parcels of land. And so here you can see an inventory of those bundles. And um, some of these bundles are really um, perfect uh, for locally grown groups like, um, like Bantu Gardens, which is a cooperative of um, mostly Bengali women who have uh, had some success selling produce from their gardens and they want, were looking to expand, um, expand uh, where, what they were growing and expand their business and set up uh, uh, an industrial kitchen. Or this here, um, this is New Hope. It's an Islamic community center in a formal commercial structure on one of the main thoroughfares. And so starting from uh, the core, the center um, over time, they bought adjacent land and buildings and expanded their uh, program of community activities. So there's, um, you know, large piece of land, you know, um, these areas here that get turned um, into a garden, 
uh, there's which you can see here there's part uh, that gets um, uh, you know big bigger block that gets turned into a soccer field um, and then there are um, there's the large empty parking lot that gets turned into a vegetable market and uh, there's actually you can see some of the images there there's a special kind of Bengali bean that does very well um, in the upper Midwest and they're um, and they're they're selling it here in the in this market so you could say that um, a new civic institution emerges out of the combination on the one hand of a kind of a larger charitable uh, mission, something that's good for the community, but then on the other hand, uh, something that's related to the pragmatics of blotting, the, you know, the picking up of the vacant land as it becomes available. And so, um, so there are these new community centers that emerge from these specific conditions and then they have a stake in the ground that will benefit from 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 this program. So um, this is uh, uh, Moten. He's um, one of the people who is actually uh, working on the ground there. So, but what I I wanted to zoom in on here a little bit is how there's this lighter um, one that's less permanent and characterized more by, uh, let's say, seasonal use or uh, by care and maintenance. And these are um, practices by the remaining residents who take care of the vacant land outside of the territory that they actually own. They, you know, they, they, they mow the land, they clean up trash, sometimes like Moton, they're even growing, they're growing things. And uh, maybe they have some interest in the land further down the line, or maybe they're just trying to be good neighbors. So it's also just a little bit, I think that it's a little bit, it is a little bit blurry here in terms of our larger discussion about commenting, but I think an important one to talk about. But so anyway, with these, uh, with these uh, stewards, we, we thought that this group should have um, some stake in the um, in the in the future of this land, and it's really prevalent as as I'm show, as we I showed here, and so I want to um, zoom into this little corner here and just explain it a little bit more, uh, just to visualize uh, to sort of add a kind of a narrative or a, um, a visualization to what I mean by this um, stewardship. So let's just zoom in there, and so you can see that Marty. Um, he takes uh, care of the Detroit Land Bank uh, next door to his, his house, also across the street. And so what you can say now in this kind of condition that the, the boundaries of property are becoming very blurry. It's a different form of land tenure. You could call it like, um, I don't know, like a land tenure light. And um, because this form of land tenure is informal and you can't find it on a cadastral map, you can't find it in a database or um, in GIS. The city certainly doesn't have um, a GIS layer that they give to you about it. But you also can't really see it, like, you know, with the block project in the beginning, like it was, that was really based on sort of like close observation looking. You can't necessarily even see this. The, um, the only way to get this information is really by talking to people, acquiring local knowledge through meetings. We actually had a lot, a lot of meetings uh, focus groups, um, smaller groups such as a women's meeting. We had kind of model buildings and game sessions, interviews, but we we also had um, uh, conversations in more informal settings. Um, and we we actually used this ice cream truck that we had going around in the neighborhood over the summer that doubled as a neighborhood map and a kind of engagement station. I think this kind of space touches upon some of the things that. Stavros was talking about at the beginning that it's um, it's neither public or private, but it's something in between. And uh, but you could say that this is a kind of um, a space where you can start a conversation um, over over ice cream. And we chose the ice cream truck as a, as a, as our medium because, like so much of Detroit, it's a very car based and very spread out. And this is a, an important and kind of ubiqui ubiquitous piece of urban infrastructure. Um, and uh, and it was ideal for a setting for conversation um, and ideas about uh, an exchange of ideas about about the about, about this neighborhood. And so um, I wanted to end on this slide here, which um, we mapped out uh, the 
patchwork of paths. So you could say like in the beginning of this project, it was really about uh, visualization and sort of telling the story of these practices. But uh, what we're working on also really is creating um, a patchwork of paths in a way um, that uh, ways in which the land can be transferred, including, uh, you know, the actual sort of uh, community spaces that is, um, you know, for, uh, that remained purely uh, public and owned by the municipality. But then also these other uh, programs, the two which we have introduced, the bundling program and the stewardship program, where um, we're working to formalize through policy and actually pilot project projects the transfer of the land from the land bank to these community organizations and neighborhood stewards. So with that, um, I will uh, end it and pass it back. Thank you so much, Georgine. That's a really amazing project and it's nice to see that on American soil because we often see some of these very experimental things happening around the world. So I'm really glad you're bringing that uh, home, so to speak. Um, we'll pass it last but not least to Stefan. Uh, Stefan, whenever you're ready. Hi. Um, let me try to share my screen. Is this working? All right, great. Um, Thank you, uh, Niraj and uh, Antje, for inviting me to uh, contribute to this conversation and uh, Star Wars, Robin and Georgine to kind of already uh, establishing a, a really kind of rich uh, ground. Um, um, let's see if my slides are moving. Um, so in, in the following, I'd like to frame commoning as a contested field uh, and a continued negotiations through which um, the commons are produced and reproduced. Um, because the commons are uh, subject uh, to incessant appropriation and reappropriation, the commons are never a mere natural resource, such as land, uh, to be found, extracted and consumed but an ongoing sex, uh, social uh, practice that creates community and in turn sustain, uh, sustains its uh, livelihood and well-being. Um, so as, as Peter Leinbau and many others since have existed, I think that uh, this echoes also Stavros' uh, introduction, there is no commons without commoning and, and there's an emphasis on the active uh, verb. Um, as we all know, since the 1980s, cities have gradually moved from a redistributive to an entrepreneurial mode of governing. And as a result, rather than acting as an agent for the common good in many instances, the state has become a vehicle of the market. Um, nonetheless, uh, within the debate on the common, I think the status of the state is highly contested uh, as an apparatus to be reclaimed uh, or to be rejected. Uh, and so, you know, although I show this diagram as kind of uh, three perfect uh, circles and a, and a stable diagram, you have to imagine that uh, these uh, spheres are actually in, in constant uh, motion um, and the relation between the state, the market, uh, public and private is, is one that twists and turns. And so as a result, we find ourselves with all kinds of public-private partnerships, such as privately owned public parks or uh, publicly owned parks that are privately operated and such PPPs I think are emblematic for how governments contribute to socializing risks uh, while privatizing uh, profits. And yet architecture uh, continues uh, to be burdened by a binary thinking that opposes public versus private space um, and here I think lacks uh, political reflexivity. The term public interest design for instance that is gaining traction in the US uh, contributes to depoliticizing architecture, glossing over the inherent tensions and conflict that are in play, at play in constituting common interest. And it is here that I believe that the commons at the third sphere help to bring the agonistic character of the political project that is, is the city to the foreground and render explicit the negotiations of power hierarchy in and exclusion that I think we've also heard uh, about in, in the previous uh, input. 
So in effect, the commons urges us to ask more complicated questions. Uh, who has authority over defining the rules of use and access of a space? Who produces it? Who cares, maintains, and reproduces it? Who benefits from it? And does that benefit contribute to our material, occupational, social, community, or planetary well-being. The commodification of all aspects of life has, I think, really flattened our value system to single bottom line. Um, but economic growth and return on investments are flawed measures of prosperity in the face of dwindling planetary resources, climate change, and an exponential uh, wealth gap that is systemic uh, to the working of uh, capitalism as illustrated in this chart by uh, Thomas Piketty. So the decommodification of land that is, I think, not only a matter of disrupting accelerating cycles of dispossession, but a matter of reframing the economy from an extractive to a regenerative logic uh, in which commoners become the stewards of the land, as we've just heard from uh, Georgine, in a much more kind of localized and circular metabolism. Now, um, the EFA exhibition and Atlas of Commoning that was uh, briefly mentioned by Miraj in the introduction, um, and which I curated uh, in collaboration with Eichplus, uh, assembles grassroots initiatives in which citizens come together, pooling resources in pursuit of a more self-determined and solidary life beyond contemporary forms of domination. And this exhibition opened in Berlin two years ago and will continue uh, to travel around the world for approximately 10 years, um, during which case studies are added in each uh, host city. So the Atlas is really conceived as a growing knowledge archive and, and a platform for exchange. Um, and here I should also mention that uh, Stavros contributed a foundational text to the exhibition catalog and both uh, Antje and Tobias uh, from Interborough Partners were part of the symposium uh, during the Pittsburgh exhibition. So it's a, in a way, a, 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 an ongoing uh, conversation that we are having uh, here. Um, and obviously there's no, not enough time to describe the exhibition in kind of detail uh, here, but I'm just kind of uh, zapping through some uh, impressions of the exhibition to kind of, uh, also highlight that beyond the centerpiece, the atlas, there's uh, kind of other uh, media and modes of uh, kind of um, really um, unfolding the practices that uh, are part uh, of uh, commoning. Now, uh, drawing from the exhibition in the second part of my presentation, I would like to share two examples of strategies for decommodifying land. Um, and as you will see, the first strategy is operating within the legal framework of uh, private property but subverts the logic of capital accumulation and uh, the latter is operating in conjunction with the state or in coordination with the state outlining the possibility of uh, what uh, one could call a public commons partnership. Uh, Vilma 19 is uh, one of 145 collective housing projects across Germany that constitutes the Mietshäuser syndicate which translates to tenement syndicate in English. Um, the syndicate uh, provides a model for self-organized living based on a solidarity economy. And its main aim is to decommodify housing while empowering its tenants uh, to kind of collectively determine how they would li like to live. Um, similar to a community land trust, the syndicate distributes uh, powers um, onto two subordinate bodies that mutually monitor one another. And the uh, diagram in the front, uh, in, in, the, in the foreground of this poster kind of tries to illustrate this. Uh, on the one hand, uh, each house is uh, self-governed by its residents uh, and their financial and legal autonomy is not only a matter of self-determination, but also protects all the other projects in the network in case of insolvency. But on the other hand, the sum of all houses constitutes a syndicate which holds 49% of the shares. And as decisions pertaining to ownership or kind of uh, major policies uh, within the, 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 the this, um, entity requires a two third majority, the selling of the building of uh, the selling of buildings or, or the land is rendered nearly impossible. So each house defines a fixed rent based on operation costs and the mortgages uh, of the property. Um, 
but those are typically significantly below market rate. Uh, and maybe more importantly, once projects have paid off their mortgage, the syndicate becomes the beneficiary uh, of the rent uh, and then reinvest the surplus capital to finance new projects and expand its this network. So um, um, there is, in a way, uh, the, the system is designed to grow exponentially um, over time and extract more and more properties uh, from the real estate market. And I think what is interesting here is that uh, the syndicate uses the legal model of a limited li liability corporation, uh, but so it operates within the logic of the market, but really subverts the principles uh, of capital accumulation in order to kind of decommodify uh, land over time. Now, uh, Vilma 19 is, I think, one of the most uh, striking architectural examples from the, 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 the houses in the syndicate because it's an adaptive reuse of a former office uh, for the East German Secret Service, the Stasi. So it was particularly kind of unattractive uh, in, in real estate terms, as you can imagine. Um, and typologically, the, the architects have, I think, played with the repetitive prefabricated concrete structure in order to accommodate very diverse household constellations that also um, deliberately kind of uh, aim at uh, challenging the heteronormative nuclear family. So uh, maybe a, a little bit uh, similar to what Robin uh, was describing, there's an emphasis also on uh, collective uh, care and collective domestic uh, labor within uh, uh, this, uh, this project. Now, just to give you kind of a, a, another example, a much more kind of bourgeois looking project from the syndicate that uh, where residents uh, actually just recently uh, moved in. Um, uh, this is Kumi 13 also in uh, Berlin. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, uh, the, the, the syndicate model has also uh, kind of been reproduced or, or introduced uh, to Austria where it's called Habitat. Um, and has two initial projects, one adaptive reuses project in Linz and a ground up construction in Vienna. So it's interesting how now, you know, in every country the, the legal uh, uh, kind of frameworks are different, but it's beginning to spread, uh, I think, into different uh, uh, cultures or kind of um, cities. Um, now, the other kind of more common examples of collective ownership um, that I wanted to introduce or kind of discuss is the limited equity a housing cooperative. Um, I'm sure uh, you're likely familiar with housing co-ops, uh, but I think what is remarkable in cities like Berlin, Zurich, and Vienna, partly in response to the soaring housing costs, is that uh, they are experiencing an unprecedented corporate cooperative housing boom. Uh, and in this map, you see uh, the 5,000 uh, co-op housing units that have been constructed in Zurich between 2004 and uh, 2014. Now, um, housing co-ops follow seven key principles, amongst others, democratic self-governance. Uh, but I think importantly, and a little bit in a kind of a similar logic of, kind of growing over time, uh, here uh, through government regulation or laws, they are bound to reinvest any profit into the development of new housing. Uh, and so their critical mass is beginning to have a systemic effect uh, on the housing market, at least of some cities like Zurich. Uh, but it's also beginning to be uh, recognized by local government as an instrument for developing affordable housing that provides more diverse and self-determined models of living beyond centralized and often paternalistic uh, uh, municipal uh, housing. Um, and uh, here, municipalities are kind of uh, supporting uh, co-ops in different capacities through uh, tax exemptions, subsidies, the provision of land and infrastructure, but also kind of in, in exchange for certain demands, uh, a mandate for specific qualities that often neither private nor public developments are able to attain. So I'll try to give you just uh, some examples. Uh, at Spreefeld in Berlin, for instance, the municipality sold the land to the co-op under the condition that uh, they would maintain the ground floor entirely public um, as to allow the kind of unrestricted access to the river uh, that this, uh, these uh, three buildings are, are, are built on. Uh, in Zurich, uh, municipal subsidies for cooperative housing bind residents to give up car ownership altogether. So if you actually uh, reside there, 
you're not allowed to own a car any longer. Um, and uh, at Kalkbreite, also in, in Zurich, uh, the city sold the air rights above a tram depot uh, for the development of a fairly large uh, uh, cooperative. But in exchange, uh, they kind of uh, specified uh, uh, a very kind of uh, um, diverse mix of users and public services that would face the street in order to kind of uh, activate what was a, uh, a very kind of blind and uh, almost kind of, um, um, yeah, kind of also kind of not so safe uh, uh, lot uh, before that. Um, and in a similar vein, at the Sonnenwend uh, Viertel in Vienna, land provision for so-called neighborhood houses, Quartierhäuser, uh, come at the condition of a ground floor rent uh, of uh, four euros uh, per square meter. So it's a really kind of affordable land in order to introduce and enable more diverse programs uh, that in turn contribute to activating uh, public space, especially in, in, in new development. So, here, in a way, this, uh, these, these deals are actually made also to kind of, uh, um, kind of um, uh, impose or enable kind of uh, qualities that are, are, are difficult to achieve uh, uh, within a kind of a market uh, logic. Now, uh, finally, many uh, new cooperative housing projects in Vienna are also including flats for refugees uh, as a way to decentralize their accommodation and kind of uh, facilitate their their integration uh, in, in, into uh, their new host uh, city. So uh, although um, you know formally uh, they are not called this way, this arrangement between municipal governments and non-profit cooperatives, I think begin to outline the possibility of an institutional uh, framework that I'd like to describe as public commons partnerships. Um, and which provide an antithesis to public-private uh, partnership. And I would argue that uh, public commons partnerships really uh, contribute to redirect our attention to the agonistic and contested processes that are inherent in tru truly democratic processes uh, and promise to revive um, the political project uh, that is the city. Um, so with these two examples, I was uh, hoping to kind of demonstrate uh, an understanding of the commons not as an idealized autonomous sphere, but uh, one that really emerges from the tensions and the messy negotiations uh, between uh, the commons, uh, practices of commoning and the market and the state. Thank you so much, Stefan. And thank you for all those presentations. It's really amazing and inspiring work that's happening around the world. And um, the case studies are really telling. Um, maybe just to jump in with a couple of questions to get us going. I'm, I'm interested in the question of scale. I think Stavros, in your presentation, you talked about um, comedy needs to um, expand and it's you know at the core of this. And this is sort of always a challenge of the emotional, social, and uh, domestic, amongst other forms of labor that happen through these local negotiations, sustaining that as well as scaling it up. I'm curious um, for any of you, and also Robin, in your presentation, you talked about the kind of quick exponential growth of the, the Black Panthers movement. Um, just these questions of scaling up something that uh, retains local control and retains the energy of those local uh, negotiations. Um, are there some strategies that you've noticed in your research along the way that allows for this to happen? Thank you for that question. Um, I'll jump in first. I think with the sort of thinking through a response. I think the Panthers, the way they um, evolved was so organic and um, unplanned in some ways, especially in the initial wave, that it's hard to imagine um, the different lessons to sort of take away. So what, first, anyone could go and join and become an or a member. Then they had membership uh, training periods that people had to undergo, membership forms and things like that. They ended up purging people that they led in during earlier waves when understandings about membership were different. They ended up 
um, I think somewhere in between, especially as they grew and they moved from being a network of people that knew people that knew people, um, there was kind of a transformation. So I think of the Panthers as kind of a manifestation, just like Black Lives Matter, I will say, like they become an umbrella for local, perhaps um, earlier efforts at political organization and people take on the Black Panther mantle. That is the spread of some chapters. Some chapters are new and inspired by the Black Panthers in Oakland. Others are more deeply rooted and um, engaged in more longstanding practices. Uh, I think this is a great question because I was thinking also about scale and scaling up, even thinking about what's happening in Detroit uh, with the um, stewardship and the different ways of thinking about land, as well as this idea of public commons partnership. So I think we can all sort of dive in on that question. Could I say something on that? <laughs> if, if somebody else wants to step in first, I'm, it's okay. No, please, the floor is yours. <laughs> okay. Um, at least in my approach, I believe that uh, talking about commoning and the commons is always taking sides. So it's uh, it's not a neutral discussion. It depends on how you enter and with what scopes. Uh, therefore, uh, I believe that uh, the idea of expanding commoning somehow indicates a possible strategy for scaling up. Uh, but this strategy uh, necessarily will have to clash with certain boundaries that uh, capitalism would uh, uh, inadvertently pose on the common, on the expansion of common. So I believe that we are talking about a contested terrain. We're talking about movements that might mobilize in order to scale up their uh, their values that transcend uh, the idea of profit. Of course, the Black Panther history is full of this kind of uh, approaches and, 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 and attempts. Clearly, from the beginning, the Black Panther Party was not in the process of developing a better condition within this uh, society. They were trying to go beyond that. So they were trying as Robin very well described to us uh, to build within their organization a prefiguration of another society. So I think this is the, the, the in my in my approach, if you want, this is the most important area of scaling up. Unless you manage to produce this kind of ruptures within this uh, society, uh, you're bound to simply, uh, in many cases, make the life of some people better, but not exactly pushing in the direction of a different society. I'm not saying that all those examples that are based on partnerships with the state are not important in commoning, but I tend to think that scaling up has to do with producing and actually uh, developing the momentum of commoning as a process that gestures toward a different society. And I have, we have examples of scaling up, not only the Black Panther experience, but also experiences that come from Latin America or from other places of the world, like the Zapatista, for example, uh, experiment of producing within an existing society, a different one that somehow transcends the boundaries that it is being um, enforced to follow. And, and this kind of um, scaling up is indicative of the power of, of commoning. I don't believe that commoning is a kind of um, um, helpful solution for certain parts of the welfare state or a helpful solution for, for uh, making life better within uh, this air conditioned nightmare as somebody describes it. So I think we need to take sides. This is my, I, I, I declare my, <laughs> my entrance to this discussion and I deeply respect all other opinions, of course. This is it. <laughs>
I might follow this up um, with a question that relates actually more to, on the one hand, to scaling up, but also really to the flow of information um, that is sort of needed for, um, you know, the scaling up in the sense of expansion or in the sense of uh, turning local um, models uh, into uh, a larger movement. And one of the things that um, I was struck by uh, is um, as we sort of think about the, the flow of information, you know, today we automatically sort of think about the role of social media and the role of, um, you know, kind of uh, spreading information in non-physical space. And um, I'm partially really uh, interested in um, where you see sort of the role of physical space in the kind of uh, expansion, you know, to use Stavros, your term, uh, in, in the expansion of the commons, you know, versus say all the many kind of resources that, you know, for to come back to Stefan's example, I know that Roma 19 and the Mietzhäuser Syndicat relies on copious resources, you know, that are online, um, you know, to some degree, we need those also to sort of inscribe and make possible further expansion, but what what is in the end sort of the role of physical space in that? Well, shall I? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't want to talk too much, but uh, maybe maybe the role of, of physical space is important. As I try to say, uh, it's it's also a shaping factor of commoning. It's not one more uh, product to be shared. So um, it's a, it's a formative element, if you want, of sharing. So the moment you choose to build, for example, like in Mexican autonomous neighborhoods, to build neighborhoods in the same way, that is to somehow spread the idea of constructing this kind of autonomy, which has nothing to do with autonomy as we know it from Europe or from the Italian operaismo. It's a different pro approach to autonomy. Autonomy means independent from the state and possibly independent from the market. This is kind, this kind of autonomy. So uh, the moment that they understand themselves not as the center of something, but just a node in a possible network, the moment they try to help others to do the same thing in other areas, reclaiming land, occupying, occupying land, blackmailing the state, not exactly in a partnership relation with the state because negotiation can take the form of partnership but also the form of of clash and and a challenge of the of the authorities so in their in their in their case blackmailing the state means that the, unless you allow us to take care of ourselves in this part of land which is not which is public mostly it's a, a wastelands in many cases unless you allow us to do that you have a big problem with us. So this is this is a process in which this is this idea of using land differently and using through this use of land the opportunity to form different kinds of communities is a kind of uh, expansive common. It's a kind of metastatic, if you want. I know that the image of metastasis is not very good, but unfortunately, indeed, this disease spreads in unpredictable ways. And uh, sometimes you, you find yourself totally conquered, although there was no, uh, there was no uh, initial notice of the, the, the possibility. So I think this, this image can describe this, the, the process. I totally understand also processes to which Stefan referred that have to do with uh, decommodifying land. I respect this approach, although I think it's not really clashing with the major mechanism of this society, it's opening passages to a different uh, treatment of, of ownership. And I, I think this is a very interesting that thing that is happening in, in some parts of the world. Um, and uh, I, I know that uh, many uh, German uh, activists and thinkers insist that this is a major breakthrough of the commoning ethos. 
and I really uh, admire the way that they try to use it as a means to also educate people in different approach to space, not simply use space, but really create space, appropriate space in ways that is productive, but also creative. I'm maybe just to respond. I mean, I, I feel that also these projects, because they are maybe less radical, are also a way to kind of, uh, you know, bring in differences into the conversation, uh, rather than kind of becoming these kind of ideological uh, 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 pockets that, 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 that are homogenous. Um, I was also going to try to kind of connect the, the, the two questions. Uh, I mean, Antje's question about the, 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 the proliferation or distribution of uh, information in relationship to the question of growth um, or kind of scaling uh, up, because um, I think that um, one thing that a lot of these uh, initiatives um, uh, are are revealing is, is the possibility of redefining the, the relationship of the local and the global, I think. Uh, um, and um, I think we are increasingly entering a, uh, a, a, a phase where uh, the, the modes of produ production will actually become more and more localized, uh, both, I think, uh, because of environmental pressures, but also through digitalization. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think the, the access, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, these local uh, uh, initiatives will less be kind of uh, isolated, but are part of a, 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 a network uh, in which uh, a lot of the kind of immaterial labor can actually uh, be broadly shared. Um, and so I, I think that the, this notion of the, the, the cosmopolitan localism or cosmolocalism is, is an interesting one to kind of begin also to, to challenge uh, uh, this kind of, uh, you know, famous uh, statement about uh, uh, thinking global and acting locally. I think it, it becomes something where we always need to act and think uh, local, locally and globally at the same time. I've um, also been thinking about the, 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 the multiple questions and then also about the presentations more generally. And I do see that um, in a way we are talking about sort of two different tracks, if we may, about commenting. One where there it's sort of ideologically sort of starting from new, kind of de novo, you know, really trying to um, create the groundwork um, in which these uh, practices of uh, and these spaces of commoning uh, can can happen, and then on the other hand, um, and and th those might be what the ones that uh, Stavros was talking about, and also um, uh, some of the examples that Robin gave with the Black Panther movement, like really kind of like reimagining what the what what the world could be in terms of you know equitable um you know uh, child care and housing and sharing of work and so on and and then on the other hand the kind of working from within and i think that some of the examples that uh, stefan gave were like you know say uh, the limited equity co-ops in in zurich or elsewhere in europe or even the examples that i gave in detroit where it's Actually, working within in in existing uh, context and trying to uh, maybe more strongly than make do, but really to kind of um, work within that context to create uh, new new ways of inhabiting uh, and appropriating uh, land. And I guess I'm wondering, in the second case. Uh, like say the examples of the limited equity co-op where we also have those or have had them in the United States, they really depend on, uh, they depend on government. They depend on, uh, might I say, good government. And, uh, and if we are commit, if, if in, in some of our work, if we're committed to working within those existing contexts, 
how uh, having a you know functioning government and having a government that cares for people is actually just so central to uh, our existence um, and our well-being. And so it's just something that's very much on my mind at the moment. And uh, yeah, I guess that's a question for me for, uh, for Stavros. Stavros, do you think, do uh, what about this kind of duality of working? I know you said that, that for you it's a, a line in the sand. There are there uh, there are the winners and the losers. Um, we have to take sides, and I agree. But can can we can we work with what we have, or do we have to start anew? Uh, sure, we, we can construct the possible different future with the materials we have at hand now. Otherwise, we're just uh, either religious uh, utopians or, you know, whatever, utopians, anyhow. And uh, I mean, uh, the nearest example in the United States is, of course, the, the Black Panther movement. They were so radical in their aspirations, but on the other hand, they were actually developing uh, their programs and, their, and their, their, their scopes within the existing messy material everyday life of people uh, feeling so much uh, uh, abandoned by the, the authorities and the state and all the other mechanism of world welfare. So uh, this proves that uh, and, and, the, and the, the only reason that they did not succeed to actually produce a, a major uh, uprising is that they were treated with harsh uh, suppression and, and uh, violence beyond, uh, beyond uh, any imagination. And this is a story which is unfolding in many places of the world with different results. And it has to do with, uh, with conditions that uh, somehow in, in certain cases provide the opportunities of developing this kind of alternative processes, whereas in, in different conditions you have a very hard uh, confrontation that, uh, that somehow produces disaster. And I believe, for example, you, you cannot imagine how, how important it, it may be that people are, uh, in certain cases, determined to produce this kind of different forms of uh, social organization. It happened in, in Rojava, for example, within a, a very harsh and difficult war condition. And they managed to develop uh, forms of uh, social organization depending, uh, totally focused on the idea that women and men are absolutely equal. They had no kind of elected authorities that were not having uh, an equal share women and, and men. They had different kinds of education and so on and so forth. So the materials with which you could bring in a different future are there real people will bring the, the different future, not uh, angels or, or whatever one can imagine. So I strongly believe in this power of people to transcend the boundaries of uh, this uh, very harsh and uh, unequal society. Thank you so much, Severus, for that and, and your question, Georgine. Um, I just wanted to pause our conversation internally to also allow for a moment for uh, the audience as well to formulate any thoughts. Uh, please add those to the chat and we'll transition now to taking questions from the audience. Open it up. To, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A and I want to make sure we have time uh, to answer those. And if there's anyone else out there that um, has any questions, please drop them into the Q&A as well. Um, the first question is for Georgine uh, from Sharon. Um, how is the duration of the blot preserved with the people to allow uninterrupted continuation of these informal activities? And I'm gonna read out Kasim's question as well because I think it's uh, related as well in terms of um, how these models persist through time. Uh, Kasim's asking about the responsibility of designers and planners to help foster consensus over long periods of times are all these models, especially the ones that Stefan presented, only applicable in the context of intentional community or residents opting in to a common practice? And uh, specifically, he's referencing the limited equity co-op uh, in Brooklyn, where the second and third term uh, co-op members have voted to go market rate, um, shifting a lot of these affordable units into uh, the market while also exercising a democratic right. So I guess 
these are aimed at uh, both Georgina and, and uh, Stefan, but uh, Robin, feel free to jump in if anything uh, comes to you during this conversation as well. Um, well, I could jump in and answer Sharon's uh, question. Thank you for that. And uh, the, the blocks are something that have been around for a very long time. And there are different types of blocks. Some are um, just an owner next to a lot appropriating it. But in many cases, the owners have actually purchased the side lot um, next to their homes. And so um, in many cases, the blot is preserved because the owner owns it. And I think that, um, but in other cases, it's just appropriation. And what we did in our work was to visualize that process and um, to share information about how to go about making those purchases. And then also through um, making that visible, also advocating for it and uh, helping to um, con convince the city government that it was a good thing to do. And so in that way, influencing policy. And I think that that um, you know, kind of dovetails to what uh, Stefan was talking before in, the, um, in response to Antia's uh, question about the role of the architect. And I think that we're all here because I think we see a, um, a more expanded role that really engages with these processes and really thinking creatively about how to um, contribute to policy and, and so on. I have lots of other answers, but I also see that we're short on time, so I don't want to hug up and give other people a chance to talk. And if that we have more time, I'll say something else. Um, I, maybe I'll just try to briefly respond to Kathim's uh, questions. Uh, thanks. Um, I think, um, and there are several there, I think, but uh, when you ask about opting in to common in practices, um, I feel like the common, the opting in sounds way too passive. That's what I was trying to kind of describe briefly when I said it. You know, if there's no commoning, there's no commons. Uh, it's it's something that requires constant uh, work uh, and investment uh, or stewardship. Uh, and 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 that's thus, I mean, I think the example of uh, a, a limited equity co-op that then is being kind of uh, privatized. This is exactly the kind of uh, the reappropriation I think that happens. But um, that's why I'm actually really kind of interested in models where. Um, um, the, 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 the reappropriation is kind of all, almost kind of uh, made impossible by design uh, that, uh, you know, uh, early on, basically, an, an initiative uh, imagines uh, how they can avoid becoming uh, the victims of their own success uh, uh, and not change their mind when they grow old and more comfortable and feel like, oh, maybe after all, it would be good to kind of retire on the uh, 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 on the return of, an, uh, of investment. And I, I think that if these things don't happen like at the very beginning, uh, then there's a, a high chance that, um, they, that they will be kind of twisted or subverted. Um, and I think in the same vein, I would say that uh, that's why uh, commoning has, has to kind of uh, embrace conflict as a kind of inevitable part of actually sharing resources. Uh, uh, and come up with uh, rules uh, and principles of how to actually work through these. Uh, and typically when that happens, uh, if that happens only once the problems arise, it's too late, I would argue. Um, it's like in any good relationship. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan. And, and maybe just, uh, just a quick question to follow up on that, Stefan. You know, the kind of idea that the commoners are constantly involved in this labor of making the commons and um, as new commoners are added into the fold it's constantly remade um, and there's just a huge amount of labor emotional social domestic and so forth um, which at the same time and I think this is comes up a lot in the research auntie and I do like we take students to various communes and many of them are interested but then they say well as architecture students we'd feel guilty living here because we wouldn't have time to participate in all the events and participate in, you know, cooking dinners and doing all these things. Um, have you seen, you know, models that have found ways to pull, because we talk often about pulling people, land out of the market <laughs> to allow land to kind of not fall victim to those, but we don't talk often about pulling people out of the pressures of the market so that they are free to at least create and help 
uh, steward these conversations, set up some of the infrastructures and so forth. Um, has that come up in your research, you know, models that might be pulling people out of the market proper? Or Robin, I don't know if this happened in, in the Black Panthers and in, in some of your research um, where there were sort of designated members that were able to just invest their time and energy into this um, act of commoning. Uh, thanks for that question. I'm interested in the, the response um, from others, but I'll say from the Panthers history, yes, they definitely, um, they tried to create structures within the organization so that their members had the health care that they were offering the community, the child care, um, you know, their, all of their expenses were taken care of. They were given what they needed in terms of you know, the stuff of life, the clothing and, and those kinds of things. So the goal was really to repurpose their labor in a way, right? So some part of it wasn't super democratic, let's say, right? So this idea of um, choice and buy-in, you know, was a real challenge for them because certainly people opted into the collective living, but like I said, there were the people who, are, when it sounds great, like drop my child off on Monday, get them back on Friday, and they've already been taken care of and and all of that, but then very real things came in the way, and people were like, well, yeah, I want to pick up my kid on, you know, Wednesday, and I can't do that, right? Mm -hmm. So the type of dialogue, I think, around the rules, I think, is very, very um, central, and I think about the Park Slope Co-op, which is like legendary. It's like a huge, it's like a city in, <laughs> amongst itself, right? But um, the cooperative part, I think, is key, and learning more about how these types of collectives and communes ran, what happened in terms of the inevitable conflict, how did, what was the transition in ideals about leader leadership, right? Was it always the same people making the decisions for everyone else. And I think that's uh, what the Panthers face. I think people are willing to make small temporary sacrifices that would be equitably shared for the larger goal. And when it became clear that everyone was not sacrificing in the same way and that others were actually benefiting from the displaced labor that other people were you know, um, disproportionately carrying, that was part of the slow, um, drizzling a part of the coming apart, I should say, of the collective um, experiment. So this question of democracy is a real one. I think that's a great point. Uh, Stefan, did you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, in a way, I think that what you're describing is coming at us uh, no matter what, uh, with basically um, uh, automation and uh, the, 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 the radical kind of transformation of work or labor. Uh, I mean, I think many countries are already beginning to discuss the kind of the four day kind of work week and, and so on. So, uh, I mean, it, the reality is that I think that if we uh, kind of stick to a, a narrow understanding of the economy as the productive, as productive labor, um, I, 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 I think, um, we will have a kind of a, even a stronger polarization between the people who are working and the ones that are not. Uh, I think the most inspiring uh, writing for me on uh, in this regard is uh, J.K. Gibson Graham's "Take Back the Economy," uh, where they begin to kind of uh, um, outline a set of tools about just reflecting about you know a, a much broader understanding of diverse economy or what they call community economy, and they they are arguing that if we look at our well-being. There's not just material well-being, there's occupation and social and community and physical well-being. And if we diversify our, our uh, activities throughout the day or uh, throughout the week, um, uh, we can actually engage in all kinds of different forms of economic exchange that are not necessarily monetary. Uh, but at the same time, they might actually lead to, on the one hand, a much higher um, sense of well-being, like personal satisfaction. Uh, but also resilience, because we actually, like in any ecosystem, if we have diverse forms of social relations, but also um, economies, uh, we are not subject to uh, kind of, um, you know, we don't depend on, on, on a single income, for instance, uh, to kind of sustain our lives. Um, 
I think that's a great point. And it's, it's been uh, sort of an inspiring, strange silver lining of the pandemic is the number of people that could go out and protest in the streets uh, because of either more flexible hours of work or being out of work. And, um, you know, you just think about that displaced labor being put into uh, taking action and providing a voice onto the street. Um, I do see one more question here from uh, Jeanette that has just popped up. Um, if, if everyone has energy to take this last question before we wrap up for the evening. Um, so I'll read it out and if anyone, if there's any takers, I will pass the mic to you. Um, it looks like there's a couple of questions here actually. I haven't had a chance to, to read through them. Um, but uh, Jeanette says, I'm hearing two interestingly different definitions of commoning, one that suggests an enclosure of a closed world, intentional communities, while another suggests the dislocation and expansion of resources away from private ownership to a broader unbounded collective, um, like Marty taking care of the lot across the street. To what degree are you seeing commoning practices do one, the other, or both? And what is it about commoning that makes it especially powerful for decommodification how do you compare it to other strategies, living off the land, basic income guarantees, et cetera? Um, so a big, <laughs> a big question to end with, um, but if you have any, any thoughts there, um, and I, I think actually maybe just to start off, I think Jeanette in, in Stavros's book, Common Space, mm -hmm. in his first chapter, he, he really talks about these different models of the archipelago and the, the relationship between the island and the field and these uh, different definitions of enclosure. Um, and I think that sort of gets at this kind of duality of how you can see the enclosure being something that allows the commoners to craft uh, resistance within the field of capitalism, but also the enclosure itself becoming capitalism. Um, so I, I really recommend for everyone uh, to take a look at that book, Common Space, and Stavros's lecture, which will be uploaded to the scaffold site um, soon after this talk. Um, anyone want to take a stab at any parts of that question? I was also going to refer to Stavros because I mean he would have insisted that uh, uh, a, a, a commons need to needs to be kind of porous uh, and needs oh, to be yeah. able to kind of welcome newcomers. Uh, that unless uh, it is open uh, uh, to newcomers, uh, they will be kind of a, an accumulation of power uh, sooner or later. And only kind of I mean having people who kind of. Uh, join in and challenge the rules and the power structures. It is constantly kind of re being redistributed. Um, I actually have a last question for Robin, if it's OK. Yeah, yeah sure, please. Um, I mean, I'm just fascinated by this, um, this notion of um, you know, uh, revolutionary movements or counterculture movements relying actually on, um, uh, you know, the reprodu reproduction of everyday life and how the Panthers really understood that um, uh, with the schools and, and um, you know, this idea of it starting at the, um, at the, at the kitchen. Um, and Naraj, it reminds me a little bit about um, Lindsay Harkema's piece in, in bracket um, about the um, kind of front stage of different um, political movements and revolutions in Russia relying on this backstage of, of um, kind of domestic spaces. And, and Robin, I'm wondering if, uh, has anyone studied the kind of spatial dimension of, of the Panthers, you know, um, you know, what was, what were the boundaries of of these collectives, you know, and, and was that um, supportive of uh, these practices of commoning or was it a challenge to the practices of, of commoning and, and bot? Um, so I'm really curious about that. Thank you for that question. It's a really interesting one. I have to say, I have not, no one has written about that as yet. Um, I would love to see more work on that. I know there's, um, uh, a young scholar, Sonia, uh, I don't want to butcher her name. I think it's Das Verge, perhaps. She writes on Amilcar Cabral and the movement in Guinea-Bissau. And she looks at it um, in terms of space and the types of space that they use, for example, for their political education and things like that. It's really, really 
um, fascinating. I'm going to type her name into the chat. I think I can spell it probably better than I said it. But um, for the Panthers in Oakland, no, I have not seen that kind of work. I can say that the, um, the spaces that they occupied were oftentimes houses that they, in which they lived collectively um, in Oakland and in Berkeley. And I don't know to what extent they tried to reimagine or repurpose those spaces. I know that in their offices, for example, were oftentimes multi-purpose used for different purposes um, with people sometimes sleeping in there and um, also a space for their, sometimes their health um, interventions. And you, know, you can get different things done in the office in that way, but I have not really thought about like what would this look like, um, you know, in a real, in a real, um, in a real sense. Like I went at the first Panther that I met, Melvin Dixon, in Oakland. Um, he was living collectively as part of a political group, and literally I met with him in his office, and then behind the office door was his bedroom, and then um, everyone's had this kind of front-facing office and this back-facing um, place where they resided, and then there was a huge kitchen um, with a huge table where people worked with uh, food preparation and things like that. I'm not sure what the Panthers version of that would, would look like. Um, definitely a great question. And um, oftentimes as historians, we don't think in terms of space enough. Well, sounds like Antia and Naraj might have a next uh, <laughs> <laughs> add, it, add it to the atlas that keeps, yes. keeps expanding. And, uh, but I think it's a really important point, uh, Robin. And I think a lot of the ex experiments that we see happened um, sort of uh, in the backstage, you know, uh, even in our research, Antia and my research, you know, these communes are often hidden and from the urban fabric. And it's only when you go inside that you understand this is a very different type of dwelling. And I think this is why these types of forums are so important to bring these conversations out into the public and to discuss them. Um, and we're just so grateful to have these amazing panelists here to discuss them with. Um, I know there are a few other questions. Um, I encourage you to follow up uh, with, with Auntie and I by email and we can connect you to the various panelists. Um, I wanna be respectful of the panelists time and energy, I know it's quite late on the East Coast right now, so um, I think uh, this is a great place to stop and I'll pass the mic over to Antia. Yeah, I just, um, you know, again, wish that we had another hour or so to um, speak with you all and I want to thank you for staying up late. And um, also apologize to anyone whose question uh, we didn't quite get to, but many, many, many thanks to Robin and Stefan and Georgine um, for uh, doing this with us twice, in fact. And um, we learned a lot from you and uh, we're really super excited about the conversation that evolved. So thank you. And uh, to everyone else, thank you for coming. And uh, we will make the respective video or videos available uh, on our websites uh, in the coming days. And uh, yeah, wish you all a great rest of your evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>